Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was known as a fairy guardian. In the past, he's a man known by many names, the demon brat, the hero of the fourth great shinobi war, the Nenadame Hokage of the Leaf. Now, he is known as Fairy Tale's very own guardian angel, an urban legend of the world of magic, who goes by the name of Fairy Guardian. Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard! Chapter 17 What Happened? Was the first words that came out of Naruto's mouth when he walked with Sila into the bar that the members of Fairy Tail usually went to after every event during the tournament. From what he could see, tension was in the air, and everyone seemed to be in a state of shock. Mavis Vermillion was sitting on the bar with Makarov, and she looked extremely worried, which wasn't that much of a surprise to him because she had been wearing that look since last night. Where is Lucy? Naruto asked, looking around. The busty blonde celestial summoner was extremely hard to miss, because she always hung out with Natsu, the one that always had all the attentions because of his colorful personalities, and was currently trying to break free from the pole he was tied to. They came to our lodging last night. Urza took a deep breath and started to explain. They came with an entire army, and had the arrest war warrant from the princess so we couldn't do anything to stop them, well, Natsu did. He tried to attack the soldiers, but we had to stop him because they had the right to arrest Lucy now. They also took my keys with him. I didn't notice until they had already left with Lucy-sama. Yukino said as she moved her cloak to the side and revealed the lack of golden keys on the key holder she wore on her hip. Her black zodiac key was there, so it seemed they did not need it to open that gate. I see. Naruto nodded his head in understanding. They had had the arrest warrant, so not even he could do anything to stop that even if he were there, unless he wanted to get into trouble, which was something that he tended to avoid nowadays. G-A-R-H Stop blabbering god fucking damn it. Natsu roared as he broke free his restraint and stood up, screaming, let's go save her. He declared, but before he could go anywhere, Makarov enlarged his hand and slammed it down Natsu's body without bothering to look at him, knocking the fire dragon slayer down and leaving a small crater on the floor, but overall, he looked unscratched, only annoyed. Cool down Natsu, we cannot act harshly. The third master said seriously as Mavis nodded her head in agreement since it's the empire that we're up against this time. However, on the other hand, they cannot treat their citizens wrong either. Makarov stated thoughtfully while rubbing his chin. Mavis spoke up, pointing out it was the princess who signed the arrest warrant, so she has to be the one behind the eclipse plan. Obviously, she doesn't have as much powers as her father, the king, but she still has had an entire empire under her authority and not to mention that there is a possibility that the king himself is supporting her plan as well, so we need to make our moves very carefully if we want to save Lucy. But I still don't get it, why captured only Lucy? Why let us go after we discovered such top secret information? Happy asked, raising his paw to draw everyone's attention toward him. Because it doesn't matter to them, a plan at this scale will soon be discovered by the public they must have known they can't hide it anymore. Naruto answered, explaining. Seven year worth of magical power is stored inside that gate, so you won't be able to miss it when it's opened. Plus, the rest of you are all famous participants of the Grand Magic Game. It would be really suspicious if not a single one of you suddenly didn't show up today. So, they will release her when it is over, right? Mira asked in concern. I think they will, but we can sit idle and wait for them to return our friend to us. Mavis said, causing Naruto to take a glance at her. Of course, she would say something like that, and it wasn't just because she was worried for Lucy's safety. She was worried for the safety of the rest of the world too. They had a member of our family, and the only links we have with several other dear friends of ours. Plus, they are meddling with something that they don't understand, knowing nothing about the consequences. Those alone are more than enough reasons for us to take actions. We have to stop them from opening the eclipse gate, or at least make sure that the worst scenarios are not going to happen, starting from rescuing Lucy. Everyone around her nodded their heads in understanding. What are you suggesting, Master Mavis? 
Urza asked, crossing her arms on her chest. She was ready to do what it takes to rescue her friends and stop the royalty from destroying the timeline. One should not forget that the king and princess of Fiori have some influence over the Magic Council, so they can eliminate us from the tournament any time they want and destroy everything that we have worked for as punishment for the stunts they we are about to pull inside their castle. Mavis explained, reminding them of their participation in the Grand Magic game for the first time of the day however, because everyone have already left such an impact on the people, it's much easy for us to handle the tournament from now on. All we have to do is win today, and it won't be matter anymore whether or not we're eliminated from the Grand Magic game because we try to rescue our friends. Everyone will still know that we're the best. It will be the final nail in the coffin. She pointed out with a smile which is why while we have a team go to Mercurius Castle and rescue Lucy, we will need to have our strongest five on the field today to fight for our image in the public eye, to make up for our guild that lost for seven years. The strongest five it is? Makarov repeated as he crossed his arms on his chest before looking up my obvious choices would be Naruto, Urza, Mira, Laxus, and Natsu. They are currently the best that we have here, and Natsu is obviously the best choice after his performance yesterday, but Naruto is banned permanently from the tournament. Naruto? Naruto, what do you think? Mavis asked, turning to her longtime friend. Don't worry, I will be on the rescue team, with Sila obviously, none of you stand a chance with the gate around to suck away your magic. Naruto said, pointing at the members of Fairy Tail Plus, I have the best chance to sneak in without alerting the guards, and get her out in one piece. So, I will take care of the gate and save Lucy, while the rest of you concentrate on the tournament. You sure, Sensei? Urza asked unsurely. Yeah, pretty sure. Naruto answered absent-mindedly don't worry, Urza, your sensei can handle it. The blonde finished as he rubbed her head, chuckling when she brushed his hand away. Then Yukino suddenly stepped forward and spoke to him I will come with you, Naruto-sama. No you are not, little girl. Sila stated seriously, but her master didn't say anything for a moment. He looked at Yukino, staring into her light brown eyes. It wasn't that hard for him to know what was in her mind at that moment. Yukino had become great friend with Lucy, and she had to be worried sick because that man had taken her gold keys. Even if she once tried to give her keys away to the blonde celestial mage, he could tell Yukino's bonds with her spirits were just as strong as Lucy's. Very well, but try to keep up. Naruto said finally, much to Sila's surprise, but her master had never made a decision without a reason, so she did not question him and step back. I promise I won't be a burden, Naruto-sama, Yukino then turned to Sila Sila-sama. You better. Else I will make you so. The demoness said, and most people could understand the true meaning behind her words. I want to come too. Natsu shouted as he stood up. No, you are not. Naruto said matter-of-factly you stay here and fight in the tournament with the others. You're noisy, and you obviously suck at stealth. You will get me and Sila in trouble the moment we step foot into the castle. Eh? Naruto is right, Natsu. Mavis said with a small smile, trying to calm the fire drag dragon slayer down. It took Natsu a moment to give up and return to his seat with his arms crossing on his chest so, now that Naruto will rescue Lucy, we need someone to replace him on the team. I want in. Gajil said firmly as he stepped forward I have a score to settle with that brat. He said, obviously implying Rogue, the shadow dragon slayer of Sabretooth. I think that will do. Mavis nodded her head with a smile and stood up. Okay, let's give it our best everyone. Everyone cheered. I leave the tournament to you, Mavis. Do not let my effort on the first two days become wasted. And I trust that you will do what is right, Naruto. The first master of fairy tale looked at Naruto and replied with a small smile. After that, the guild parted. The tournament team consisted of Natsu, Urza, Mira, Laxus and Gajil went straight to the Domus Flau, with several members of fairy tale following behind them. To prevent suspicion, everyone had all agreed that they would normally cheer for their team with the best of their ability. Everyone would be busy watching the tournament, 
making it a perfect scenario for Naruto and his team to make their way to the castle without anyone noticing. Yukino, come here. Naruto suddenly called after everyone had left. They needed to wait for the first event of the day to start to take action. What is it, Naruto-sama? Yukino questioned curiously. We need to change your clothes if we want to sneak in quietly. Your hair is already too bright, and that cloak you're wearing will only get in the way. Yukino widened her eyes in realization, and flustered when Naruto started eyeing her from head to toe. He could see it in the way she ran and carried herself around, did you practice martial arts? Why yes, I train hand-to-hand -hand combat for a few years before joining Sabertooth. Sabertooth. Perfect. Naruto nodded his head while rubbing his chin thoughtfully okay so you need something easy to move around with, since we need to be quick and stealthy. We will also need something else to make your hair less eye-catching, since it really shines in the light. He nodded finally, clicking his fingers when something popped in his mind okay, let's go. We will grab that outfit for you on our way to Mercurius Castle. Yes, I understand. Yukino said as she followed him outside, but Naruto-sama, how exactly are we going to grab it? To be fair, she did not imagine Naruto to be the kind of guy who would carry women's outfits around. Line break. You're wasting our time. Sila impatiently shouted into the dark alley where Yukino was trying to put on her new outfit, which Naruto stole from a local shop whose owners had left to watch the tournament. Why yes, I am so sorry Sila-sama. Yukino said as she hurriedly ran out of the alley and stopped before them, carrying her white dress in hands. Her new outfit was black in color, being a skin-tight bodysuit that had net-shaped designs on the sides and on the forearms with various line borders that separate the two, coming in straight and curved patterns. In addition, she also wore black boot and a bandana that kept most of her hair from being exposed to the sun. The flower on the side of her head had also been removed h how do I look? She asked hopefully while looking at Naruto. You look great. Naruto grinned as he took Yukino's clothes from her and sealed it away in a scroll. The bodysuit really did justice to her incredibly attractive body. I will return these to you when we're done. Now, let's get a move on. Yes. With that, the two went after Naruto, heading toward Mercurius, Mercurius Castle. While Sila seemed to have no trouble keeping up with her master, Yukino was having some troubles doing the same. However, she was doing much better than Naruto and Sila could hope her to, as she was fully capable of following Naruto as he climbed onto rooftop to avoid the guards patrolling the street. They are expecting us. Naruto said as he looked at the guards running around from the rooftop of a restaurant. Yesterday there was no guard on the streets, and now they are full of them. I can clear a path for us, master. Sila said. Thanks, Sila, but I don't think that will do. Naruto pointed his hand toward a group of guards that was not too far away from them. You see that squad over there? They haven't left that street since the moment I saw them. Every one minute, a guard leaves the group to report to the nearest sentry guards and the sentries also keep an eye out for the groups patrolling near their stations. Operating like this, one guard suddenly disappears or for some reason alters his patrol pattern, then the entire city will come after us, or at least they will know that we're here and we are coming for Lucy. Naruto stated. With that, the three continued to make their ways to the castle, easily avoiding all sentry guards on the roads and also on the rooftops, mostly because while they had a great plan, the way it was carried out was done rather poorly by the guards. He had a feeling it was the first time they had done something like that, and had to give props to the one who came up with such a plan, obviously someone that he had met before in the past because they knew about Sila and her powers. Watch out, do not step onto that stone. Naruto said as he helped Yukino climb over the roof of Mercurius Castle. They were about 100 feet from the ground. Because there was a small army of heavily armed soldiers guarding the main gate, they had to take a higher route to approach the castle. One mistake could ruin the whole operation. Operation. Naruto wasn't too worried about Yukino or Sila falling, because he could catch them easily, but someone could easily see them as they were in midair. You're doing very well. He complied with a smile as Yukino stood up beside him. T thank you, Naruto-sama. 
Yukino said as she put her hands on her knees and looked down I have never been this high before. So, you're saying you have never ridden off a Yukis or one of the Pisces before? They really don't like it, Naruto-sama. Yukino laughed nervously as Naruto chuckled, shaking his head. The blonde then turned around and looked at the castle in front of him okay, let's look for a window. It didn't take it long for them to find one leading to a fancy hallway. Master, someone is coming. Climbing in, Sila heard footsteps and snapped her head around to inform Naruto, who quickly grabbed Yukino's head and pushed her down, hiding outside while Sila herself soundlessly disappeared into a room, just in time a group of guards appeared from the stairs on the left. Man, they really don't want us to get Lucy out quietly, do they? Naruto asked with a small chuckle as the white-haired celestial mage made a small smile and nodded her head. This high, the winds were strong, so the guards inside would not be able to hear them. It took the guards a few seconds to leave, and when they did, Naruto and Yukino climbed in as Sila opened the door and walked out. I think we're clear. This way, I know where Lucy is. Naruto said, having found Lucy's location even before he entered the castle. The three made their ways down several floors, and entered a darker, less elaborate section of Mercurius Castle. There was a staircase that led down to a basement of some sort, and the further they traveled down, the more it looked like a dungeon. Torches lit up the halls as empty cell after empty cell was passed, and it seemed as though there was very little to no inmates present, catering to good behaviors of citizens ar around Crocus. Someone else is here. Naruto suddenly he stopped and looked around a corner. There were two shadows walking toward them from the other side of the room. Both were wearing cloaks so he couldn't tell who they were, but one of them was holding a medium-sized orb between her right hip and wrist. Master, allow me. Sila said as she stepped forward, but Naruto stopped her by grabbing her shoulder. There's no need. He shook his head and walked out himself, making himself known to the other two people. Morning, what are you two lovely ladies doing in a place like this? Altair Milkovich widened her eyes in surprise as she looked at the man standing in front of her you are. She said, and then turned her eyes to the girls behind him. She knew Yukino of Sabretooth from watching the tournament, but had never seen the other one before. However, there was something about her that felt familiar. Obviously she was not human, with the horns on her head. With their former associations with the Dark Guild Grimoire Heart, Sila knew who they were, but she had never met them. In Tartarus, Kyoka was the one who took care of the Balam Alliance's businesses, having met both Altair and Mirdi during meetings with Grimoire Heart several times in the past when the Alliance was still powerful. Sila, meanwhile, was the executor of Tartarus, carrying out killing orders in the name of her guild, so anyone who had met her would not live to remember who she was. You are those two girls who was tagging along with that dude Jalal, Urza's childhood friend right? Naruto asked Altair and Mirdi? Yeah. The pink-haired young woman nodded, what are you three doing here? I suppose you are not here for sightseeing. Yes, we're here to rescue Lucy, it's a long story. Naruto answered with a nod. Nod. Both Altair and Mirdi widened their eyes and looked at each other meaningfully, making Naruto raise an eyebrow and wonder. They had to know something that he didn't. What about you two? He decided to ask. We're following Azeroth's magical signature here, but it disappeared a moment earlier so we're looking for it now. Naruto nodded his head in understanding. He heard from Urza that Crime Sorcier's main goal was to take down Zeref and his followers, making sure that no one else would fall down the paths that they had had in the past. Do you notice anything suspicious around here? I don't think so. I see. Altair nodded her head before continuing. Do you need our help getting Lucy out of here? She's our friend too. We can lend you a hand. If you insist, then I won't stop you. Naruto said simply as he walked past the two and made his way further into the dungeon. Sila and Yukino quickly followed him, leaving Altair and Mirdi to trail behind them. The dungeon was huge, but it didn't take it long for them to find Lucy, who was lying on the straw bed in one of the cells in the middle of the place, contemplating heavily for the trouble she had gotten herself into. Lucy-sama. 
Yukino called as Naruto crouched down and knocked his hand on her cell with a smirk on his face, making the blonde-haired celestial mage widen her eyes in shock while looking at them. Hey there Lucy. Mirdi giggled while waving her hand. Why do you fairy tale mages always get yourself in these kinds of situations, I have to wonder. Altair shook her head and said with a small smile. Naruto, Yukino and... Lucy exclaimed in surprise, but before she could continue to acknowledge the other three, Naruto reached his hand into the cell and covered her mouth, stopping her from continuing to shout out their names. SHH, you don't want to alert every guard in this castle, do you? He asked, before reaching up and snapping the lock with his hand, shocking both Altair and Mirdi with how easily he made it look. Taking his hand back, Naruto stood up and opened the door as Lucy hopped onto her feet. It's time to go, Luce. He said, teasing her with Natsu's incorrect name for her. We bring you some spare clothes, Lucy-sama. Yukino said as she handed Lucy one of her outfits Naruto had taken from Honeybone and sealed into a scroll that he carried with him. The celestial mage quickly undressed to put on the new outfit, since the one she was wearing was her sleepwear and they were already dirty. Naruto moved to the side to give her some privacy, and to also keep an eye out for any guard who might enter. While changing, Lucy told them. Hold on, we have to find our keys. She said while putting on her top. They're taken to the eclipse gate. However, before she could finish her sentence, they all heard a loud click and before most of them could react, the floor underneath them suddenly opened like a trapdoor and caused the girls to lose their balances, exclaiming in surprise as they fell into darkness. Naruto, meanwhile, sprung around when he heard that sound and launched himself toward the girls, grabbing the nearest one first with his arms around her waist. Hey, watch where you are putting your hands. Altair exclaimed when she felt his hands on her butt. Shut up woman, now is not the time for that. He shouted back and disappeared in a flash of yellow, only to reappear an instant later on the ground beneath them. Naruto then put Altair down and shot up, yet again in a flash of yellow and returned not even a second later with Yukino and Lucy, shocking everyone with his speed. Mirdi was next, and last was Sila, who he caught bridal style in midair before falling down and landing beside the others. Thank you, master. Sila smiled as Naruto put her down. She could have easily taken care of her falling, but nonetheless she was very grateful that her master had caught her. You're welcome. Naruto grinned before turning to the others, is everyone all right? I think so. Yukino answered, nodding her head. I feel a bit dizzy though. Lucy said while holding the side of her head. You will be fine soon. Naruto patted her shoulder before turning his head around. It looked like they were in a cave similar to the dragon graveyard, but there were some dimly lit torches on the walls, making it easier for them to look around what the hell is this place? And to answer his question, a stern, feminine voice spoke up, you have fallen into my trap. Everyone widened their eyes and looked around to see an enormous image of a green-haired young woman wearing a fancy dress and a golden crown on her head looking at them with several knights standing behind her this pitfall place is a capital of death, the last stretch of freedom for criminal scums like you. Die and rot there, thieves. She finished with a strong tone. W who is that? Mirdi asked, wondering out loud. She's the princess, Hejui Fiori. Yukino answered as the image finally disappeared. Well, that's quite a speech. Naruto chuckled as he looked around while scratching the back of his head unless you want me to drill a hole through the walls, which can cause the entire structure to collapse on us, we need to find a way out of here. Let's find an exit. With that, he started walking around with everyone. There were human bones and corpses all over the ground, creeping both Lucy and Yukino out. Jaya! It's alive! Lucy suddenly shouted in terror when the corpse that she accidentally stepped on shuddered, causing everyone to turn toward her direction. Hey, isn't that? Yukino exclaimed in shock. The body that Lucy stepped on was none other than Arcadios, the one who had revealed the eclipse plan to them. Stripped from his armors, he was lying on the ground with bruises covering the majority of his body and tattered clothing. The man had definitely seen a better day. It's Arcadio-sama. What is he doing here? 
He was arrested for treason, remember? Naruto pointed out with his arms crossing on his chest as Mirti approached him, using a quick medical spell to help him recover on Yukino's request. They must have dropped him here to die like us. Mirti was no healer, so it took her a moment to heal most of the bruises on his body and make Arcadios open his eyes, and when he did, the first thing he said was our run. In that instant, Naruto felt something running toward them and turned his body around in time to block a gigantic fist with his arms. His eyes widened when he suddenly saw smoke coming from the sleeves of his jacket. Acid. Naruto clicked his tongue in annoyance and twisted his body around to deliver a strong kick into the giant man's torso, sending him away. Much like the rest of his clothes, his jacket wasn't some normal clothing, so even after coming into contact with such corrosive substance the sleeves were not melted away completely. His skin, on the other hand, was unscratched. Nice kick, here I thought you're done for. The acid user told him with a smirk as he stood up. He was a man with a large build and overly muscular arms, which were wrapped with bandages at the wrist. Compared to the rest of his body, he had disproportionately smaller legs, and his eyes were narrow with a triangle-shaped nose. His hair was stylized in a spiked pompadour that spread out onto his face in wide, arrow-shaped sideburns. His attire consists of a light-colored shirt with fur at the collar that he wore under a dark vest, all of which covered by a sleeveless jacket with the words acid rule written on the back. Before Naruto could say anything in return, a whirlwind of paper appeared and turned into a young woman, with long, dark brown hair and long bangs falling over her face and into her eyes, save for a single strand which curled upwards away from her head. Her chosen attire was a simple black dress that wrapped around her body as a robe. The front was left wide open, allowing her legs to be in full sight, whilst the back was much longer, being tailored to fall into two points. The edge of the cloth was patterned with squares, and the entire outfit was kept around her body through the use of a thick cloth belt which was tied just below her breasts and into a huge bow that sat at her back. There, there are more of them. Altair cried out in alarm when a flower rose from a crack on the ground, growing tremendously in size before opening up to reveal another woman with messy violet hair. She had an ample bust and a curvaceous figure wearing a big puffy cap on her head that was designed with a dark strip at the front with six light do dots presenting a V-pattern and a matching brim that covered her eyes. For clothing, she wore a long coat with petal-like edges on the tails and was adorned with dots running across the edges over a dark top that revealed much of her cleavage and a ruffled miniskirt. She also wore arm sleeves and long boots that reached to her calves, with a flower bracelet can be seen on her right wrist. It's, it's them. Arcadio said shakily as two more figures appeared from the shadow, one of them being an average build man with purple hair wearing a metal mask and a set of armor and two sides on his back, while the other was a man whose massive, mildly square head was almost completely bald, bearing a long, wild, and spiky dark hair on top of it, reaching down to the middle of his back. However, his most distinctive features were his oversized arms and biceps, with only two massive, mildly pointed toes on his feet. His clothing, meanwhile, greatly resembled those worn by the fishermen, carrying a flag-bearing symbols related to the sea on his shoulder. They, they are an independent unit that supports the kingdom from the shadow, its strongest executioners, the Garu Knights. In case you are wondering, I am not asking for a dramatic introduction. Naruto said as he looked at the group of wizards standing in front of him. You, you don't understand, their presence is alone make returning alive from this place impossible. The man in the armors, who seemed to be the leader, stepped forward as he said in a low menacing tone, making Yukino and Lucy step back nervously. By way of the special decree vested in us, we, Fiori Independence Squad, the Garu Knights, hereby sentence you criminals to death. The members of his group smirked, looking at them rather confidently. The exit is this way. He suddenly said and pointed his hand to the side, much to everyone's surprise and his squat shock. Era, thank you so much. Naruto smiled in satisfaction. What the hell man? Yusuke, the fisherman asked. The expression on his face remained unchanged, but even Arcadios could tell he was worried. I? I didn't mean it. Kama, the armored leader, shook his head in denial. You? He looked at Naruto, what did you do? Me, I didn't do anything. 
Naruto raised both hands in defense, smirking before pointing his hand toward them. And in case you are wondering, I am not thanking you, I am thanking her. With that, the knights snapped their heads around to look at the black-haired woman who suddenly appeared beside them with a stoic expression on her face. Despite feeling shocked by her sudden appearance, they quickly reacted and leapt away from Sila, creating some distances between her and them. From the moment they looked at her, they could tell she was extremely dangerous. When did you? Kamika muttered in surprise before taking out a small piece of red paper, holding it between her index and middle fingers, Do doesn't matter, take this. Kamika then released the paper from her hand and blew it, creating a wave of red-colored paper toward Sila. The demoness said nothing as she took control over the female knight spell and sent it back to her, forcing Kamika to use blue papers to create a shield of water in front of her. Most of the wave came in contact with the wall of water and disappeared, but the rest was controlled differently and flew around, slamming into Kamika from the side and exploded, knocking her away. Kamika! Damn you! Cosmos cried out in surprise and casted her spell, summoning a massive flytrap plant from the ground. The flytrap then slammed its petals around Sila, devouring her whole and causing Yukino and Lucy to cry out her name in horror. However, before Cosmos could celebrate, the flytrap was torn to pieces by a strong bust of Sila's energy that generated around her body in the form of an intense bluish aura. The plant user widened her eyes in shock at the display of power, but quickly casted her next spell and summoned thick, spiky vines from the ground, launching them toward Sila. The demoness tilted her head to the side as if she was curious, before slashing her hand horizontally, cutting the vines to pieces before leaping forward and slamming her fist into Cosmo's stomach, knocking her out. She, she took two of the Garu knights so easily. Arcadio stated in shock, looking at Sila with eyes as wide as dinner plates. Kama and Nepa, the acid user, tried to attack Sila at the same time, but the goddess of the chill moon easily avoided all of their attack. At the same time, Yusuke used his magic to control the gravity around her, trying to slow her down but the entire time Sila seemed to have no problem moving and countering the attacks from the Garu knights with a series of unarmed strikes, which was so strong she actually left cracks on Kama's sides and armors, yet she didn't look like she was trying at all. Altair, Altair and Mirdi were shocked. The two had had encounters with demons in the past, but they could tell none of them was anywhere near Sila's caliber. They both knew there was a special race of extremely powerful demons born from the Book of Xerath, but since they could not sense Xerath's presence or his magical signature from her, she couldn't be one of them, could it? The fight continued on for another one minutes or so, before Sila decided to end it. Seeing an opening for her to unleash her power, Sila leaned back, forming a circle of kanji around the palm of her hand as she unleashed a portion of power within her limit, causing the entire cave to violently shake and the ground to become unstable for some of them to stand still. Disappear. The goddess of the chill moon muttered and thrust her hand forward, generating a massive blast of energy that blew away everything in front of her, including the three conscious Garu knights. It was so great that the entire castle above them was shaken under her power, shocking everyone who was inside, and when everything was over, anyone could see the destruction she had caused with a single attack, which was something that went beyond what they had expected. The Garu Knights, meanwhile, was nowhere to be seen, leaving only Cosmos on the ground before them. However, because Sila didn't use much of her power, Naruto was sure they were still alive somewhere in the cave. Sila, grab that girl, she can show us the way out of here. Naruto said as he pointed his hand at Cosmos, oh by the way, great work. He grinned, giving her his thumb up. Thank you, master. Sila coolly replied with a small smirk, but in truth, she was feeling overjoyed to have her master praised her. Their journey to retrieve the Zodiac Keys continued shortly after that. Chapter 18 Now, now, do not try anything funny. Naruto said as he pushed Cosmos forward, telling her while smirking, oh wait, you can't. Sila made sure of that, having full control over her body. The party was making their way through Hell Palace, with a clone of him helping Arcadios at the back. He had mostly been healed by Mirdi, but still too weak to walk on his own. Um? Naruto-san, you sure we don't need to tie her up? Mirdi asked curiously as she followed Naruto and Cosmos with the rest of the party as the later led them on a path leading to the exit of the cave, looking rather willingly doing so. 
I have a pair of magic ceiling handcuffs here if you need. There's no need. The blonde smiled, shaking his head Sila can take care of it. Hearing her master saying that, the black-haired demoness raised her head with confidence and continued to coolly force Cosmos to lead her master out of the cave the princess had dropped him into, giving no care for the others. Her curse had some limitations that Naruto knew very well, and yet he still had so much trust in her. To Sila, that was simply everything that she could ever hope for. So what is her magic? She can control people or something? Lucy asked in interest. Kinda, she can take full control of the body of her victims and manipulate them in the form of orders. However, she can't control the mind, so they will still know exactly what is that they are doing. Naruto answered with a nod. I see now, so that's why that man in the armors told us where the exit was without intending to. Yukino said in realization. W.L., then please remind me to never get on her bad side. Lucy nodded her head while trying to force a smile onto her face. Anyway, how are we going to find your keys once we're out of here? Altair asked, having learnt the reason Lucy was captured and needed to be rescued, rescued a moment ago. Being someone who had spent her entire life studying time magic, Altair understood the risk of time traveling better than anyone else. Naruto also couldn't help but think that she knew something very important about it when he saw the look on her face, but still decided not to ask. Easy, they are either in the princess room, or somewhere near the eclipse gate. Naruto explained, and when he saw the confusions on everyone's face, he continued, I believe she has already used them to unlock the gate. Eh? Yukino made a sound in surprise. She did not expect that at all. I noticed there was a set of keyholes on that gate. Naruto explained you open the door with the keys, but if you don't give it a push, then the door will remain closed, especially a door of that size. Something must have stopped her from doing so, could be hesitation because she understands the risk too, or she is simply waiting for Eclipse to open it. I see. Lucy nodded her head in understanding, and couldn't help but ask we're not too late, aren't we? I really hope that we're not. Yukino said worriedly before noticing something up ahead of them. Hey, is that? She pointed her hand and smiled in relief when she saw it was a massive, arched door. Finally, the exit. Mirdi stated with a smile and turned to Cosmos to ask is that really the exit? Yes. The violet-haired woman answered blankly. The look in her eyes told that she was forced to do so. Good, now got to sleep. Sila ordered and clicked her hand, making Cosmos lose her consciousness and fall to the ground in a dull thud. Well then, let's. Naruto said with a cheeky grin and started making his way toward the door, but before he could walk more than two steps, steps, he suddenly felt a very familiar magical signature on the other side of that door, approaching them in a slow pace. It was weak, extremely weak, almost unnoticeable, but it was there and could not belong to anyone else. His eyes widened and he snapped his head to Lucy, who could only look at him in curiosity. What is it? Master, what's wrong? Before he could answer Lucy's and Sila's questions, the door was opened and a shadow appeared, but it soon turned into a cloaked figure. Most of their features were kept hidden under an elegant, full-body hooded cloak, which left only the lower of half of her face exposed to the public eye. The cloak was dark in color from top to bottom with a much lighter color on the edges of the hood. It's, it's you. Altair said in shock, breaking the silence. You. Naruto snapped his head around and looked at Altair, asking while pointing his hand at the cloak person, who was a bit taken aback by his outburst, you know she's here. And you didn't think it was important to tell us? He didn't expect this to happen. Surely, he should have asked. I learnt about her from Jalal. This is my first time seeing her here. The black-haired woman answered with a finger poking his chest. And in my defense, I didn't because I didn't know how Lucy is going to react to this information, but I intended to tell her as soon as we left this place. Tell me what? Lucy questioned in surprise, before looking at the person who seemed to be looking right at her. Something seems so familiar about her. Who are you? She finally decided to ask. 
The person said nothing at first as she started tearing up with tears running down the side of her face, sobbing quietly while looking at them. Reaching up, the young woman grabbed her face, trying to control her emotion while saying, I, I'm so sorry. With that, she took a hold of her hood and slowly pulled it back, finally revealing her face much to everyone's shock. Even Sila had a look of bewilderment on her usually stoic and calm face. There was no mistaken, the smooth blonde hair that flowed and fell directly down below her neck with too much sizable prominent strands reaching past her neck and several, spiky strand covering her forehead, the beautiful face that displayed a set of big, oval, but tearful brown eyes matched with thick eyelashes and a pair of thin dark colored eyebrows, with small thin lips and a mildly round nose. It was Lucy Hartphilia. Eh? Lucy cried out in shock as she looked at the young woman who looked exactly like her, taking several steps back in both fear and horror. She had seen Gemini turning into her several times before, but for some reason she knew this was different, really different. I'm sorry. The other Lucy said apologetically as she lowered her head. Another Lucy-sama. Yukino stated in shock Gemini? No, that's not it. I still can't believe it. Mirdi said in a low tone. She's from the future. Altair explained, mostly to Lucy who had calmed down a bit but she was still shakily looking at her doppelganger. Her doppelganger. She must have used the eclipse gate to travel back in time. Jalal met her last night and told us about her. That's correct. The other, future Lucy said, giving a small nod you should have learnt about it by now. I see. Present Lucy said in understanding, but she couldn't stop wondering why would she use the gate to travel back to meet them, knowing the risks and consequences of time traveling. Why are you here? What are you doing here? She asked in a soft tone. I came here to warn you. Future Lucy answered as her voice became weak with each word she said. Soon, this country will be. However, before she could finish, her body started to shake and moved from side to side before her eyes rolled back and she passed out, falling forward. Naruto quickly rushed forward and caught her before she could hit the ground, immediately noticing something missing when he grabbed her right shoulder. Her arm, poor girl, must have been through a lot. Naruto thought as he bent down to pick her up, carrying her bridal style in his arms before looking around at the rest of the group, let's get out of here first. He told them before walking on ahead. Line break. Leaving the Hell Palace, everyone quickly made it to what seemed to be a massive dining area and decided to settle down for a moment so future Lucy could rest and Mirdi to check on her condition. Naruto had left and returned a moment later with some chips and snacks that he stole from the kitchen for the girls. Lucy hadn't had anything since last night and Yukino looked a bit worn out as well which he couldn't blame her because she had done her best to keep up with him on their way to Mercurius. He had also learned that Fairy Tail had won the tournament a moment after they had left Hell Palace with Mavis' brilliant strategies, leaving everyone, including the other participants, in shock and awe. How is she? She? Naruto asked Altair, who was standing guard at the entrance to make sure no one would accidentally walk in and see them. Lucy? She's still recovering but Mirdi has done everything she could. The black-haired woman said as she looked at the blonde lying on the carpet, with her past self sitting on the chair beside her. It must have been hard for Lucy, seeing her future self like this. So what is your story? Naruto asked as he tore open a bag of potato chips I saw a look on your face when Lucy told everyone she was from the future, and I had a feeling it had something to do with time traveling. Have anything interesting to share or get off your chest? he added with a small smile. I am a good listener. It's nothing really, it's just... Altair shook her head before sighing longingly. I once wanted to change the past too, you know? It was the reason why I practiced the arc of time. I was taken away from my mother at a very young age and was experienced on over a long period of time because of my potential to become a powerful mage. The people who abducted me, they lied to my mother, who sent me to them thinking they could cure me from my illness for having too much magic power confined inside my body. They told her I was dead. Altair looked away and swallowed heavily as she continued I managed to escape, but when I went home, I saw her with Grey and Lion. In case you are wondering, my mother was their teacher. 
She was the one who taught them ice magic. Naruto nodded his head in understanding, but he didn't say anything so that Altair could continue during the time I was experienced on in that lab, I had this ugly feel feeling that my mother had abandoned me, and when I saw how happy she was with those two. I broke, and believed she had replaced me with them. She paused for a second before continuing in a sad tone I was taken in by Hades, the master of Grimoire Heart, and when he gave me a wide selection of lost magic that I could practice, I chose the Ark of Time, because it was the magic that gave its user the ability to manipulate time. I thought I could somehow use it to travel back in time and change the past for the better, for myself. I see. Naruto said finally. When I learned that there was the Eclipse Gate, I had a hope that I could finally do it. I could finally travel back to that day and tell my mother that I was alive. Altair then turned her head and looked at Myrdi, who was trying to strike a conversation with Sila, much to the demoness displeasure but when I looked at Myrdi, I couldn't help but wonder what would happen to the two us if I changed the past, knowing how much it could alter the future. I don't know, it might be better for the better, or for worse. I can finally live a happy life with my mother, the life that I have always wanted, but what about Myrdi? I took her family away, but there were two others with me that day, and I was not the one who decided to attack her village. I was the one who decided to spare her life and took her in, adopting her as my own daughter. What would have happened to her if I were not there to make that decision? When I think about it like that, I didn't have that hope anymore. So you're willing to sacrifice your own happiness for her? Altair looked at him and nodded her head firmly yes, I am. Wow. Naruto said as he rubbed his chin with a smile, she must mean a lot to you. She means everything to me. Altair answered with a small smile. We all need someone like that in our life, especially if it's covered entirely in darkness, you know, to be our guiding light. Is that, that so? Naruto asked, smiling as he turned his head to look at Sila, who saw him looking at her and returned his smile with a beautiful one, with her head lowering a little. You are. Lucy is waking up. Myrdi suddenly called when she heard a whimper from the future Lucy and saw her moving around. Everyone quickly gathered around her as Lucy slowly opened her eyes and looked around while sitting up, holding her head in her hand. Where am? I. She asked. From the look of everything around us, I'd say it's the castle's dining hall, Lucy-sama. Yukino answered as Myrdi kneeled down behind Lucy to help her sit up more easily. So we're still inside the castle then. She concluded, holding her head with her hand while sweating bullets. I don't understand, from what I can remember, after we escaped from the dungeon, we were then recaptured by the royal army, because we somehow approached the eclipse gate and got our magic drained, rendering us powerless. Not only that but... Naruto wasn't supposed to be the one who came to rescue me. It should have been Natsu, Wendy and Mira. She said, looking at him. That must be what happened in your timeline, not us, your presence here must have altered it somehow. Altair explained. This is the reason why time traveling is so risky. It's like shooting a bullet through a glass window, not only will you leave a hole there, but you will also make several unpredictable cracks appear. I am sorry, but I didn't have any other choice. Future Lucy said sadly as she lowered her head. I came back to hopefully prevent a future that had become so bleak. What happened, Lucy? Naruto asked. What is going to happen? A horde of 10,000 dragons happens, Naruto. They are going to attack the city and destroy the entire kingdom, taking countless lives in the process. She revealed much to everyone's shock and terror. They would never expect to hear something like that in a million years, and Sila was as mortally shocked as the others. The only one who was able to keep a straight face was Naruto, as he listened to what Lucy had to say I was knocked out during the attack, and when I woke up, I was separated from everyone. Most of the city was destroyed, and there were screams and cries everywhere as everyone tried to fend away the dragons. I didn't know what to do, but I somehow I ended up at the Eclipse Gate. I didn't know a thing about it, but before I knew it, I had opened the gate and traveled back in time on July 4th, X793. Isn't that a few days ago? Myrdi asked in wonder before exclaiming with her eyes widening in surprise, remembering what Jalal had told her and Altair. 
Hold on a second. You said July 4th then, what was the shadow that Jalal saw on July 3rd? Altair asked, shocked. Wah! What do you mean? Every year like clockwork, we have been sensing a mysterious magic power, yet you said you only arrived recently. Altair answered hurriedly what we've been sensing for the past seven years must be the magic power of the Eclipse Gate. This year though, it came from a human. A human. You traveled back in time using the magic of that gate, and some of that residual magic must have lingered on your body. I know, because I can feel it even now. Jalal has been trying to track it down ever since we arrived and yesterday, before he told us about you, he said he saw a shadow that carried the same magical signature and tried to follow them on July 3rd, but was interrupted by the council's army. D does that mean? Yukino stuttered in realization. There's another person here. Naruto nodded his head, stating seriously another time traveling, hold on, where is that man, Arcadios? He asked while snapping his head around to look for exiled knight, but couldn't find him anywhere. Then suddenly, they all heard hurried footsteps. Before Naruto could say anything to warn the others, a massive troop of heavily armed soldiers came rushing in and surrounded them from every direction, quickly forming a battle formation with their weapons drawn and pointing at them. Take a step toward me, and you will live the rest of your life rejected. Sila said as she glared murderously at the knights, causing a few of them to step back nervously. However, the rest didn't heed her warning and foolishly attacked them. The demoness clicked her tongue in annoyance and blasted most of them back with a small burst of energy before disarming them with a simple macro order. As Yukino stepped in to protect a defenseless future Lucy, gracefully taking down several guards with some hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques, Altair created duplicates of her orbs and shot them at the rest, knocking them unconscious before they could even make a step closer to them. However, that was not the end of them, as more and more guards appeared and rushed into the room with overwhelming number, before five individuals stepped forward and stood before them. Ah, it's you five again. Naruto said mockingly as he turned his head to look at the the Garu Knights. All five members looked like they had seen better days. Their bodies were covered in cuts and bruises, their clothes were torn and Kama's armors were broken in several places. With one of his weapons destroyed, the leader of the executioners only wielded one scythe on his back. Do not look down on us. The Garu Knights won't go down that easily. Kamika said as she took out a small piece of red paper. Indeed, Kamika. Cosmos nodded her head as she summoned her plants. We have you cornered. Nepa said, smirking with a bottle in his mouth. You won't leave this place alive. I do not begrudge your motives and reasons, so please, do not begrudge ours. Kama said as he removed his broken mask and dropped it on the floor. His cloak was tattered and his armor was in a very bad shape. Sila's energy attack had really done a number on him. We simply cannot allow fugitives to set foot outside of these castle walls. Nepa saw an opening when Naruto yawned and decided to attack him, rushing toward the blonde and trying to slam his purple glowing fist into his chest. However, Naruto moved his body back and allowed a very annoyed Sila to step in, punching Kama in the chest with so much force he was sent flying across the room and crashing into a group of guards, who were all knocked down to the floor when they tried to catch the large man. Really? We are really doing this again? Naruto asked, amused. Nepa, are you all right? Yusuke asked his usual blank expression. Yeah, shit. I will live, but... The bulky man coughed while trying to stand up. I told you we need a plan. Kamika said with a small sigh as she took out a set of colorful papers. She alone is far too strong for us to take head on. Ah, very good, learning from experience. Naruto commented before smirking, but the question is, what are you going to do? Yusuke, do it. The leader of the elite executioners ordered as he removed his weapon from his back. Yusuke gave a small smirk and held up his oversized hands, casting a spell that he hadn't used before against Sila, causing the floor to start rumbling and trembling before breaking apart and collapsing. He then casted another spell, turning the entire floor beneath them into a deep pool of boiling lava, and increased the gravity around Naruto and everyone to pull them down as quick as possible while forming a barrier around them, 
making sure that they couldn't leave. Oh! Making a sound of mocking surprise, Naruto created several massive arms of pure orange energy from his back and used them to grab everyone but Sila, who quickly climbed on his back before he landed on the pool of molten lava and stood upon it like standing on solid ground, shocking everyone who was looking. Kama, who had foreseen that they would not be able to kill them that easily, jumped down and went after them with the help of both Kamika and Yusuk, but before he could even reach one of them, the gravity field around them disappeared when Yusuk was struck and blasted away by a massive lion head made of light, a technique that Lucy knew very well. Kama's attack, meanwhile, was countered by Sila, who shot up from Naruto's back and blocked his scythe with the back of her hand before turning her body to deliver a fast and powerful kick to the side of his torso, breaking his armor completely and sending him crashing into the opposite wall with great force. Loke? Lucy exclaimed in surprise as Loke, the celestial spirit Leo, appeared and struck down several guards to open a path into the room above them. At the same time, getting down on one knee, Naruto then placed his hand on the lava surface and started reducing its temperature with an ice release technique, solidifying the entire pool into solid ground before putting the girls down when he was sure it was safe enough for them to stand on. How did you? Because I can freely pass through the gate, of course. Loke gave her a small smile as he jumped down from the upper floor. You haven't summoned any of us today, coincidentally Miss Yukino as well, so I came to make sure everything was alright. He said, and showed Lucy something that made a massive smile to spread out on her face your stars are with you, Lucy. He said, giving the blonde her golden keys before smiling at Yukino your keys as well, miss. Thank, thank you very much. Yukino said in relief as she held her keys close to her chest Pisces, Libra. I am sorry. Ah, it's you. So Virgo is telling the truth after all. Loke said suddenly as he turned to Naruto, causing Lucy to look between them in surprise. You two know each other? She asked, missing the meaningful look Naruto was giving the lion constellation, which basically could be translated into say a word and I'll kill you. Loke, however, didn't feel intimidated in the slightest and continued to look at the taller man with a small smirk. Yeah, I used to kick his ass around. Naruto answered finally, crossing his arms. Lucy had never summoned him in his presence, so of course she would think that it was the first time two of them had met. Little Cub didn't know who he was hitting on. Lucy nodded her head in understanding. So the two of them had known each other from back then when Loke was still an active member of Fairy Tail, after his contract with his former summoner, Karen, had been cancelled because of her death. Hey! Hey! You could have warned me she was taken, you know? Loke said before giving him a genuine smile anyway, it's great to see you after all this time. We will have a lot of time for catch up later. Altair said as everyone turned their attention to the guards who came rushing through the doors, albeit with some trouble because of what the area had been previously. Lucy and Yukino have their keys. I think it's our cue to find a way to get out of here. That wouldn't be a problem, everyone grab onto. However, before Naruto could finish his sentence, he suddenly felt another presence similar to Lucy's, but this time, it was filled with evils and malicious intents. Then, a knight at the end of a hallway suddenly cried out in horror and threw both hands into the air before falling down, seemingly disappearing into his own shadow without a trace. The shadow then spread around and across the hall, swallowing every guard including the remaining members of the Garu Knights before pulling away. What the hell? Mirdi asked in shock as she looked at the scene before her. Everyone, stay alert. Altair called out as a cloud of dark smoke appeared before them, and from within, a man emerged, wearing a small smirk on his face, which greatly resembled someone they knew from Sabretooth. His hair was much longer, however, being tied in a high ponytail that reached midway down his back, and rather than being completely dark, it was black only on the right, and white in color on the left. Meanwhile, his bands were brushed over to the right side of his face, obscuring the majority of it from view. He face, however, were noticeably different, with scar that extended over the bridge of his nose, and a sharp, curved tattoo around his left eye, with a snake-like pupil. For clothing, he wore a long, light, high-collared cape that draped over his shoulders, adorned with a tiger print pattern and fastened to his body with a strap and a button on either side of his chest. Underneath, he wore a light-colored, long-sleeved shirt, wherein the cuffs were rolled up, 
with a dark, Y-shaped vest. In addition, he finished his outfit with a pair of light trousers under the loose pieces of cloth and strapped boots. Who are you? Altair asked with a firm tone, having picked up the malicious intent from the man standing before them. I am Rogue Cheney. The Shadow Dragon Slayer calmly answered. Eh, but he's out, does that mean you are from the future too? Yukino asked when she realized it, being the only one beside Naruto that wasn't looking at him warily and cautiously, which was understandable because she and Rogue were on friendly term when she was still a member of Sabretooth. Yes, I am. You decimated the soldiers to save us? Loke asked as future Rogue approached them. No, he did it because they were in his way. Naruto spoke up emotionlessly. Why are you here? I am here to open the gate. He answered, extending his hands to the sides you see, there are two ways of using the eclipse, one is travel through time and the other is as a weapon, the eclipse cannon. It's the only means we have of defeating 10,000 dragons. His explanation left almost everyone speechless, especially future Lucy, who looked at the male time traveler in shock. Is, is that so? Yukino asked in relief so we can beat the dragons. However, before she could finish, Naruto interrupted, nah, I don't believe you. He said, making Rouge widen his visible eye because even if it could do something like that, there was no way the Eclipse Gate could fire a shot powerful enough to bring down a group of ten dragons with only seven years of built-up magic energy, let alone ten thousands of them. them. You are from the future too, so you should know well how powerful they are, and that they are not mindless animals. They will destroy the gate even before you can wipe out a very small number of them. Thank you, but ten thousand dragons? Nah, I will take my chance. Naruto said, pointing his hand to where the gate was. It had been moved out to the front yard of the Eclipse Castle, with wizard guilds gathering together around the city. Believe me or not, it's true, it's the only chance we have. The time traveler shook his head, and Naruto had to admit he was a very good liar, because everyone but him was having some trouble not believing him. In Sila's case, she simply didn't trust anyone but him, especially human. I come from a future seven years from now, where dragons have already conquered most of the world. Not even a tenth of the human population survived and of course the eclipse doesn't hold anywhere near as much power as it does now. If we don't stop the dragons, or most of them here, the world is doomed. Okay, so we'll open the gate, what's next? Naruto asked, he was more interested in the stories than anything because he knew the gate would be opened anyway. There was no reason for him to stop it, as he had already seen it doing so. It's not that simple, because seven years ago, which in other words, now, some someone stopped us from opening the gate. Rogue answered, closing his eyes, because of that, the gate was not opened, and we couldn't fire the cannon at the dragons. They brought about the destruction of this world. He then looked up and said finally, that's why I am here, to kill them before they could do it and doom our world. Is that really necessary? Lucy asked nervously. Can we convince them or? I don't know, we really don't need to go about killing people. At such an important intersection of time, words alone cannot control it. Rogue shook his head even if they're convinced now, it's already decided that they would close the gate. It's an inescapable destiny, in which the ones meant to survive live on and the doomed ones, perish. That, however, Naruto didn't think he could agree more. It was the reason why he didn't try to stop the gate from opening, despite knowing what was about to come and the troubles it could bring the event had already been set in stone. Without it, many things would have happened or wouldn't have happened. History would have been altered forever. He wanted everything to remain as how it had been. However, what he was going to do from now was a whole different story. The gate was going to be open to the past, which needed to stay intact, not the future. What he would to do from now, what future he was going to choose for himself and the rest of the world, would be entirely up to him to decide. So as long as they're alive, the ones who destined to close the gate would do it with, without fail. Rogue finished finally. I see, so who are they? Who do you need to eliminate? Naruto asked curiously. He knew who it would be. He didn't need to be there to know that. 
The gate was opened by celestial magic, using the 12 keys of zodiac constellations, so only someone who capable of using it could close the gate. It's them, Lucy Hartphilia and Yukino Aguria. Rogue exclaimed and thrust his hands forward, throwing two spears of shadow at the aforementioned young women and causing both of them to freeze in shock. Future Lucy tried to protect her past self and friend by throwing herself in the way, but Naruto beat her to it, as he could see them coming from a mile away, and intercepted at the last second, appearing in front of both celestial wizards in a blur. Grabbing the spears with his bare hands, Naruto threw both of them back at their creator, who willed them to disappear before they could reach him. However, he suddenly felt a sharp pain coming from his right shoulder, and turned his head just in time to see a kunai stabbing into his flesh. It had been thrown with so much power Rogue couldn't keep his balance and was knocked down to the floor. You are the Shadow Dragon Slayer, so you, of all people, should know better than anyone when something is hiding in the shadow of the other. Naruto said simply as he lowered his hands while Rogue was picking himself up, abruptly yanking the kunai from his shoulder. Loke, get the girls out of here and protect Yukino and Lucy, both of them, from harm. I will handle this with Sila. Don't have to tell me. The lion celestial spirit smirked and gave him a thumb up before looking at the others, come on ladies, let's go. But? Future Lucy said unsurely, looking at Naruto who was having his back to her and everyone. Don't worry, we can handle it. Naruto said, giving her a thumb up without looking back. Your future is in good hand. The young celestial wizard looked at him for a moment before smiling softly and nodding her head. Thank you, Naruto. Be careful, Naruto-sama, Sila-sama. Yukino told him as they left. Rogue made an attempt to chase after them, but Naruto quickly swept himself in the way and drove his fist down his head, smashing Rogue face first into the ground. You dare. Actually, it's her that you should worry about. Naruto said and Rogue turned his head to the side just in time to see Sila's foot coming toward his face, having only enough time to fall into his own shadow to dodge her kick before sliding his way up onto the wall, where he then remerged and went down to attack Sila. The Inferious Demon quickly used her macro to pick up the rocks around her and formed them into a shield between her and the future Shadow Dragon Slayer. However, by unleashing a wave of shadow from his hand, Rogue easily destroyed the shield, but he immediately met with a Sila who had a bluish aura around her body. Before he could react, the demoness shot her hand up and grabbed his face, overpowering him with her superior strength and slamming his head into the ground with much so more power than her master had previously done, before picking him up and throwing him away to the other side of the room. She followed him and sent her fist toward his gut. Rogue crossed his arms in front of him and blocked her punch, but it still didn't stop him from being sent flying and crashing into the wall, which cracked and then broke down around him. TCH, don't stick your nose in my business, demon. Future Rogue said as he stood up and looked at Sila, who had rocks, debris and weapons flying in circles around her. She then willed them to fly at the Dragon Slayer, raining down from every direction and forcing him to dodge repeatedly. Get out of my way. He quickly gathered and immediately released an enormous burst of shadows his mouth, covering the entire area in darkness and causing the castle to tremble. The blast took out the remaining rocks easily, and continued to travel towards Sila, who didn't even flinch when the wave of shadow crashed into her. A moment later, when his attack had finally ended, Rogue was left utterly speechless when he saw Sila still standing without a single scratch on her body. Her outfit was torn in a few places, but overall, she looked completely unharmed. This is not good. I need to retreat or else she will ruin my plan. Is that it? Sila asked coldly, before moving toward Rogue, who was fully prepared and waited for the exact moment when Sila was right in front of him to release his second power, generating a blinding fla flash of white light from his body that surprised Sila and caused her to raise both arms to shield her eyes away from the light. Rogue smirked and disappeared into his shadow, slipping away before the demon could regain her vision. Well, that's unexpected. Naruto said as he casually walked through the hole Sila had created on the wall to make his way toward his self-proclaimed servant. White Dragon Slayer magic huh? Make me wonder what happened to Sting in his future. Master. I am so. Ah, don't be, you have done well. 
Rogue has his part to play, so killing him here won't do anything good to the timeline. We only need to buy enough time for Lucy and the rest to get out of here. They are probably at the gate now. He smiled at her savior strength, there's a bigger fight coming, and I will also need you to do something for me. It's very important. He finished seriously, making Sila harden her eyes. Anything for you, master? Naruto nodded his head and smiled. Chapter 19 Is it okay to leave them behind like that? Mirdi finally asked as she looked around the corner to make sure that no one was following them. Them. They had found their way out of the castle, but guards who had taken their orders too seriously were still chasing them, instead of going to outposts across the city to prepare for the attack of 10,000 dragons, from what they had heard. I mean, that guy looked really strong. Above them, Eclipse had already begun with the moon covering the sun entirely. Don't worry, he'll be fine. Yukino answered confidently Naruto-sama is very strong, and Sila-sama isn't someone you should underestimate. Altair nodded her head in agreement. Yeah, there's something not normal about her. She's way too powerful even for demon standard. Altair said, tilting her head thoughtfully. She knew there were only two species of demon, the normal ones, and the ones born from the Book of Xerath who she knew from experience had some quite unique magical signatures that were quite similar to their creators. Altair had been keeping a close eye on Sila ever since she saw the horns on her head, and she did not show any sign of being a demon created by Xerath, but Altair was quite sure she wasn't a normal demon either. I'm not sure but, there's also something familiar about her. She finished in a low tone, more to herself than to the other, before shaking her head and turning to the others anyway, we will have time to think about that later. We have a much bigger problem to worry about now. The time which reminded them and looked to the side. They could see Eclipse Gate from where they were, and it wasn't far, standing in the front yard of Mercurius Castle. Is it okay for us to wander around here? Yukino asked worriedly, I mean, he said we we were the ones who closed the gate, and, led the world to destruction. She said. We won't do it. Lucy stated firmly, giving her fellow celestial mage and future self an encouraging smile. There's no way we will do something like that, especially now that we know what will happen if we do. Yeah, it's the benefit of time traveling. Altair said there will be consequences, but it can't be as bad as 10,000 dragons, right? Yes. Mirdi smiled and nodded her head in agreement. We should find the others, we will help everyone in every way that we can. Lucy told them, and with that, they left the area and made their way to the front yard of Mercurius Castle. At the same time, they could see the citizens as they were being evacuated from the city. Everyone seemed to be in celebrating mood, and there were fairy tale banners across the city, but it couldn't be help. No one knew when the dragons were going to arrive and all that the royalties could do was keeping as many of their people safe from the incoming disaster as possible. Fairy Tail could not even defeat one single dragon with their combined strength and four slayers in their disposal, while Acnologia was indeed abnormally much more powerful than the rest, and yet 10,000 of them were coming. Could they really take out that many dragons with the Eclipse Cannon? Could it really do something like that? Lucy couldn't stop herself from thinking about the gate, about Naruto's words and the logic behind it. He was right, even with seven year worth of built up magical energy it was hard for her to imagine that there was a mag magic weapon capable of wiping out 10,000 dragons at the same time. If future Rogue was really telling the truth, then what was going to happen if the Eclipse Cannon could not take them all out, leaving a few hundred, extremely powerful creatures behind for them to handle? She knew there were seven powerful wizard guilds with six dragon slayers currently in the capital, so no doubt that the king would ask for them to aid his army in order to increase their chance of winning, but it was hard for her to determine any other outcome of the upcoming battle. Also, where did they come from? In recent years, dragons had been said to disappear entirely from the world with the only exceptions being the dragon slayer's foster parents, leaving themselves to be remembered as a little more than a myth. Yet, suddenly, they were going to return? Why? Why did they do that? For what reasons did they come to Fiori, of all places, and with such insane number too? 
Lucy grounded her teeth as her mind raced with unanswered questions. Still, she had an ugly feeling that everything was connected to the gate, somehow, which was the reason why Loke had returned to Celestial Realm with her request to ask the Spirit Crux, the Southern Cross, to analyze the Eclipse Gate. She wanted to know everything about it, and if it could really use as a weapon or not. It didn't take it long for the group to find the rest of Fairy Tail and the other strongest guilds of Fiori in the heart of Crocus, where a spectacular plaza with a tall white crystal stood. Rune knights, including their captain Arcadios, who was wearing a unique set of armors, were gathered around two people, a short old man and a young woman with green hair, who they could assume that were the king and princess of Fiori. The king, Toma Ihe Fiori, was looking at the wizard standing in front of him, with a worried expression on his face. Natsu! Lucy called when she spotted a mop of pink hair among the crowd, earning the attention of its owner, Natsu Dragneel. He was standing with the rest of his team, with the exceed happy standing on top of his head to have a better look at the gate. There you are. Her future self immediately threw the hood of her cloak over her head so that she might avoid unnecessary attentions and questions from the others. Lucy? It was Urza who greeted them with a smile as the other members of Fairy Tail looked at them. You're safe, but where's Naruto? She asked, looking around for her teacher but couldn't find him anywhere. He stayed behind with Sila to hold back an enemy for us to escape. She explained and turned her head to look at Natsu, who had probably taken notice of future Lucy with his keen nose. What are you doing? She asked. She smells just like you. He pointed out with a straight face, trying to have a good look at future Lucy, who became rather uncomfortable. Hey, aren't you? He blurted out, with his eyes widening in realization. It appeared that Wendy had also come to realize it as well. That's enough, Natsu. Altair decided to step in and save future Lucy from the trouble, grabbing the cloaked blonde by her shoulder and gently pushed her back. This young woman has been through a lot. She will tell you and everyone who she is when she's ready. Altair said sternly. What you know, you should keep it to yourself. Geez, relax will ya? I'm only surprised. Natsu answered with a forced smile, deciding to step back. Don't worry, I won't trouble her anymore. He said finally, folding his hands behind his head. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he gave the other Lucy a massive grin, making her smile a bit as well. Good. The time which nodded her head in satisfaction, hearing the small word thank you from the girl standing behind her. What's going on, everyone? Mirdi asked, looking at the king and princess of Fiori. Beat me. We were called out here by the king. I think he is about to give a speech or something like that. Gray answered, crossing his arms on his chest as Toma stepped forward and stood on the ledge of the plaza to look at the assembled wizard guilds of his country. With a deep voice, he began everyone, thank you for coming. He started. I'm deeply sorry that we don't even have time to celebrate the Grand Magic game, but at the moment this country is in extreme danger and we would like to ask for you to help us defend it. He paused, allowing the wizards to have a moment to take it all in before dropping the bomb in a few minute, hours if we are lucky, this country will be attacked by a horde of 10,000 dragons. His words shocked almost everyone to the core. Most couldn't even believe what he had just told them. 10, 10,000 dragons? Makarov repeated while sweating bullet. For real, we are going to face that many dragons? Evergreen, a member of Fairy Tale, turned to the others to speak we couldn't even do anything against Acnologia. It's true that he's a special one but still. Lisanna shook her head worriedly. You see, we have a weapon that can help us defeat them. It's the Eclipse Cannon. He said, extending his arm toward the gate before them when it's opened, it will release a massive blast of magical energy, capable of wiping out the dragons. All the mages widened their eyes in shock, but didn't say anything so the king might continue however, considering the number of enemies, a few, or even a few hundreds of them might survive. He then lowered his head and pleaded desperately wizard guilds, please, help us. I want you to use your power to defeat the dragons. Please, help us save this country. Yeah. Of course, of course. 
leave it to us. Everyone cheered while smirking confidently as the king thanked them quietly with tears flowing down his cheeks, we won't let some monster destroy this country. It's our country. We will protect it. Dragons, huh? Sting asked, looking fine unlike his dragon slayer partner, who had bandages wrapped around the majority of his body, so this is our turn. Yes, the time has come. Rogue said as he crossed his arms on his chest before looking at Gadgeel, who he had lost to earlier that day we cannot lose to them. Let's prove that we can close the gap by slaying more dragons than them. Kagura, is it okay for you to be out here? Urza asked the swordswoman in concern. Yes, I will, fight with everyone else. The mermaid heel which said as she used her own sword to keep herself on her feet, at the same time being supported by her best friend Miliana. She had been defeated by the fairy queen in a battle between swordswomen, but not before battling both her and Minerva in an intense three-way battle during the climax of the final day. Now, don't force yourself. She shook her head before turning to the sky dragon slayer, who was standing with her new friend Wendy, can you do something to help her? Yes. The blue-haired young girl said determinedly as she stepped toward Kagura and started healing her with her magic. I will help too. Kelia cheered before joining her friend, quickening the healing process anyone who was injured, please come forward so we might heal you. There's a massive battle incoming, so everyone had to be in the best shape. Attention, everyone, we're opening the gate. Hejui declared with a firm tone as she raised her hand above her head. Behind her, the gate made a rumbling sound as the gear at the bottom moved very slowly and the moon symbol in the middle overlapped the sun, pushing back the massive pillars that kept the gate from being opened one by one. Everyone held their breath as they looked at the gate, expecting something amazing to happen soon. Why is she opening the gate now? Yukino couldn't help but ask. I think the gate needs time to charge up the shot, something like that. Lucy shook her head. For some reason, she suddenly had a bad feeling and decided to contact Crux earlier than she should have. Let's split up. Makarov said. At the moment, he was discussing a strategy with the other guild masters of their respective guilds, and it didn't take it long for them to come to an agreement fairy tale will protect the central area of the town. Sabretooth will protect the west. Minerva, who had stepped up to become the temporary guild master of the second most powerful guild of fairy tale, nodded her head. The Pegasus will handle the dragons from the north. The guild master of Blue Pegasus smiled. Lania Scale will protect the east. We girls will take care of the south. We will provide support to anyone who needs us, wild. I'm truly amazed. Lion smiled as he looked at the guild masters, it's been a while that we have a chance to fight together like this. Yeah, don't lose behind. Gray smirked. The gate is opening. Someone suddenly shouted, and everyone's attention was turned back to the gate as its doors slowly opened, shocking everyone with a massive wave of magic energy. Lucy looked at the gate in both shock and awe, having never felt anything like it in her entire life. It's really happening. Future Lucy said in a low tone. Is this really our last hope? With this, we can really wipe out the dragons. Altair said, but still, to release it at one point as a cannon blast, it's almost impossible. Humanity will be. However, before that sentence could be finished, Lucy suddenly stepped forward, forward and made her way toward the gate, blurring out something that left everyone in a state of shock. No, we must not open the door. She said in a normal tone before exclaiming as loud as she could you need to close it now. Lucy Hartphilia. Arcadio stated in surprise while looking at the blonde, who pushed through the crowd to get closer to the gate, what is she, what are you saying? Close the door right now. She continued to shout as the gate was finally opened, almost blinding everyone with its light, you can't open that door. You can't. The princess stepped forward and raised both arms to block Lucy, keeping her from advancing further this is the only weapon that we have against those dragons. If you close the door now, we can't open the eclipse cannon. There's no such thing as an eclipse cannon. Lucy shook her head in denial and pointed her hand at the gate that thing is a door. It's a door that connects time. 
The release of the accumulated magic power is the cannon. Hijui argued in frustration. Leave it, Lucy Hartphilia. Arcadio stepped forward and said while shaking his head. You're going against this country's princess. Hey Lucy, what's going on? Natsu and the rest of the team appeared behind her. Lucy-sama, why do you want to close the gate? Yukino asked worriedly. It's because that door is connected to 400 hundred years ago. Exactly at that moment, they heard a rumbling sound. Then, the ground shook, making quite a few guards to lose their balance and fall down. What came next was a roar that tore through the sky and left everyone freeze in horror. Then finally, a gigantic dragon emerged from the door. Arcadio's eyes were wide in horror at the frightening sight before him no way. You're kidding me right? The princess blurted in fright a dragon came from the door. Then, then, the dragon opened its mouth and roared, blasting everything around him away and destroying a massive amount of structures across the city with a shockwave as the ground was cracked and shook violently under its power, sending the wizards tumbling while a few of them tried to hold on to each other or anything that were near to keep themselves from being blown away. This size, can we really defeat this thing? Urza asked shakily while Wendy was trying to pick herself up beside her. The young sky dragon slayer was shivering in fear. Oh no, another one is coming out. Yukino gasped in horror with her hands covering her mouth as another dragon ventured out of the gates. It had blue scales with gray bubble-like spots running along the back, a back fin started from the head and went down the back and reaching the tail, with massive wings on its back. That was not the end, however, as another came out from the gate, which had finally stopped glowing and revealed the time and area it connected them to, a valley where an army of dragons was coming, blackening the sky with their size and number. A flaming dragon was the next one to make it through the gate, with his entire body being covered in fire, almost looking like a burning skeleton of an enormous creature. Three dragons made its way into Crocus, not minding the buildings that crumbled or burnt under their feet, or the monuments that their wings and tail demolished completely. Now is not the time to fear. Makarov suddenly roared as he enlarged his body to almost match the dragons in size we have to stop them. Fight! He bellowed and his voice snapped the wizards back to reality. Reality. At once, they launched their most powerful spells at the incoming dragons, but the only things that could truly affect them were the spells of the dragon slayers. However, there were still very little that they could do and it was almost impossible for them to keep a single dragon from continuing to advance forward and enter Crocus. Ten, ten thousand are coming. Hijui cried in horror as she looked at her hands. She had done it. She had doomed the entire world. How do we close the door? Lucy asked as she put her hands on the princess' shoulders. Quick! She shouted impatiently. With a shaky tone, she answered with, with that pedestal over there and celestial magic. That was enough for Lucy and she turned around to run at the gate as fast as her feet could carry her on the shaking ground. However, before she could run any further, a wave of fire came rushing toward her and Lucy was left frozen as she couldn't think of any way to escape. Watch out, Lucy! Urza, wearing her Fire Empress armor, appeared beside Lucy and blocked the wave of fire with an enormous shield that seemed to start melting away as soon as it came into contact with the hot fire Netsu. She cried out, and the pink-haired fire dragon slayer immediately jumped in to devour the rest of the hot fire, empowering his next attack that he threw at the nearest dragon, knocking it to the ground and making it roar thunderously in pain. Everyone! We need to cover Lucy so she can close the door. She commanded loudly. Okay, let's do this. Natsu roared and launched into the air. Without wasting any more time, Lucy turned around and ran at the pedestal, taking very little time to figure out what she had to do with the help of her spirit crux, who had been communicating with her from the celestial world. Grabbing the handle with both hands, Lucy channeled her celestial magic into it and pulled as hard as she could, trying to close the gate while her friends and several wizards from other guilds did their best to protect her from harm, at the same time battling the other dragons. Lucy San. Is the door still not closed? Wendy asked as loud as she could, trying to let her voice reach the older mage. At this rate, there'll be no end to the number of dragons that cross through the door. 
Why? Lucy screamed and tried to pull the level as hard as she could, but much to her dismay it didn't move in the slightest, why won't this door close? Her strength will never be enough. A voice could be heard across the area, and from shadow, Rogue Cheney from the future emerged with a smirk on his face. What the? The current rogue muttered in shock, looking at his future self with his eyes widening as wide as dinner plates. You! How could you? Lucy turned her head around to look at him and gritted her teeth in anger, but she didn't stop trying to close the gate. She had to, or else the world would end. It's him. Hijui stated while shaking he's the one who told me about the dragons. He deceived you, Heimsama. Arcadios told her, standing protectively in front of the princess. Listen well, foolish citizens. Raising his hands as several dragons suddenly gathered around him, being controlled by his dragon supremacy spell, the evil shadow dragon slayer declared from this moment forward, the human species shall become extinct, now begins, the era of the blah blah blah. But he was interrupted by a familiar voice and the sound of something soaring through the air, flying toward the dragon standing on the building behind him. An explosion was heard, and everyone widened their eyes in awe to see a very familiar sphere of energy expanding from a shuriken-like projectile, swallowing the entire dra dragon into it. How stupid can you be? I'm still here, aren't I? Naruto Uzumaki asked with a smirk as the dragon that had been hit with his raisin shuriken fell heavily to the ground, becoming the first dragon to be slayed that night. He, he slayed a dragon, just like that. Arcadios muttered in shock, looking at the young man who suddenly appeared before them. Unbelievable. Sensei. Urza said, feeling hope returned to her. However, she had to admit she was a bit terrified by his power. You're here. Was he really always that strong? Ah yes, I am. With a smirk, he said before reaching his hand out to grab Yukino by her shoulders, lifting her up and turning her toward the gate you, Yukino, don't just stand there. Help Lucy close the gate. Combining your powers and you two will be able to do it. He said and gently pushed the young woman while dragons continued to make their ways into the city from the gate. The rest of you, help evacuate the city. I'll handle this. The smile on his face disappeared and his tone became serious as he turned around and calmly walked forward the dragons that were all nervously looking at him. You're not going to fight them alone, what the? Whatever Sting had tried to say, it died in his throat as he was knocked back when Naruto unleashed a massive wave of his own energy, sending almost everyone around him to their knees. It was also much more powerful than what had been unleashed when the eclipse gate was opened as well as several times much more terrifying, as the ground around him cracked, the ground rumbled, the clouds on the sky scattered and the rocks rose into the air and hovered around him. Golden energy then flared around him and coated his body like flickering flame before flowing around him to form a full-length Hayori, with two small horns on his head six Magatama marking around his neck, some sort of prominent swirl design over his stomach, and various other lines extending along the rest rest of his cloak and body. Sensei, this is. Urza muttered in bewilderment while struggling to keep herself on her feet. Ah, don't worry, I will not ask you to successful do this trick the next time we have our lesson. Naruto said. This is something of my own. He then grabbed Natsu by his scarf and threw him at the future shadow dragon slayer, much to his and everyone's shock. What the f-u-c-k? He cried out. Beat that shit up. He tried to kill Lucy and Yukino. Naruto called after him as Natsu crashed into a wall when future Rogue moved his body out of the way. However, even before the dirt could clear, Natsu had already stood up and launched himself at Rogue, slamming his fist into his face. Is that so? Then you can leave this to me. The fire dragon slayer answered seriously before throwing a flaming uppercut at his opponent, launching him into the air before following after him by shooting fire from both of his feet. Clicking his tongue in annoyance, future rogue then regained his balance, and blocked Natsu's incoming punch, before engaging the pinkette in an intense battle in the air that then went across the city. Now, that leaves me with you guys. Naruto said as he turned his attention, back to the dragons that were all looking at him menacingly, because they were told to kill him by like everyone in the city, and somewhat nervously, 
because they recognized him and knew who he was. So, you stupid flying lizards aren't going to make any comment about me? The blonde taunted. Chuckling humorously, he continued. Hold on, you can't, can you? On the top of Mercurius Castle, Silat stood with an intense amount of bluish energy flaring from her body, while being covered by a cloak of golden energy that she acquired from her master to become stronger. Using her macro, Sila had forced a transformation upon her body, by removing her own limitations, taking on a more demonic form than before, with her skin darkening and her horns becoming noticeably larger. Her hair became much wilder, and the clothes around her torso disappeared, revealing her bare chest to be covered in an intricate, symmetrical tattoo that began at the choker around her neck, and ended at her stomach and hips. In addition, her lower body significantly changed, with her legs changing into narrowed stilts that gradually widened up to her hips, flaring out into two wing-like protrusions as her feet changed into those of sharp blades. Do not let them speak a word about me Sila, whatever you do. Her master's words echoed in her mind as she glared at the dragons. She was using Marco to keep them from making comments about her master and reveal his true identity to the world. She had never been able to control dragons with her power before, even in her released form but with her master empowering her in her most powerful state, she found the task just a bit hard to do. Still, Sila felt that she could do a lot more than that if she tried even harder, pushed her limits even further. She could make them kill each other until there was not one left, but she always listened to her master's order, and it was him who had told her to not do it and let him handle them. All right, let's do it. Naruto shouted and shot into the air with so much force he created a shockwave and knocked almost everyone standing around him back. Urza looked up and widened her eyes when she saw a yellow flash traveling across the sky, and three dragons fell with their torso being torn apart. Her sensei stopped in midair, and created a four raisin shuriken from his two hands and the energy ones that rose from his shoulders before throwing them at the dragons that tried to attack him, generating devastating explosions that took down several of them at the same time. W what is he? Makarov asked while looking at all the dragons that fell from the sky. This is unreal. Come on. First time I got to have fun in such a long time and you guys are going to leave me hanging like this? Naruto asked as he turned around in midair and threw a pair of kunai with explosive tags at a dragon just to piss it off. He then landed on the pointy tip of the roof of a tall building, and made a come over gesture with his hand while smirking come, I will take on all of you at the same time. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfiction. Looking forward to having you on board again.